Today, we're going to dig into a paper that tackles a question we all wrestle with. You've just fixed a femoral neck fracture in a younger adult. You're writing the post-op orders. What do you say about weight-bearing? Well, it's a classic dilemma, right? But this recent multi-center study out of Japan might just give us some evidence to rethink our go-to protocols. So let's break it down. So here's our game plan. We'll start with the big clinical question. Then we'll unpack how the study was actually done. After that, we'll dive right into the results, looking at non-displaced and displaced fractures separately. And finally, we'll wrap it all up with what this could mean for our day-to-day -day practice. All right, let's get right to the heart of it. You've done a great job, the fixation is solid, but what's the best way to load that repair in a younger patient? Honestly, there's no real consensus. We're constantly trying to walk that fine line between getting the patient moving early and protecting our fixation from mechanical failure. And that's the million dollar question this study is trying to answer. Do we get them up and moving right away? Or do we hold them back a bit to protect that fixation? What does the evidence actually support? This paper aims to give us a much clearer picture. You know, what's really interesting here is how our goals shift depending on the patient. For our elderly population, it's all about preventing deconditioning. We want them up and bearing weight. But for our younger, more active patients, the priority really shifts to preserving that native hip biomechanics, and that means avoiding femoral neck shortening. That's really the crux of this entire debate. Okay, so how did these researchers actually go about answering this question? Let's get into the nitty gritty of their methods, because as you know, understanding how they did the study is absolutely crucial if we're gonna trust their conclusions. So this was a pretty big effort, a multi-center retrospective study that pulled data from 11 different hospitals. They started with this huge pool of 926 patients. From there, they filtered out patients over 65, those with different fixation methods, or people who were lost to follow up. That left them with 151 patients. And to make the comparison as fair as possible, they created these age-matched groups for both non-displaced and displaced fractures. That's the data we're really going to focus on. The two groups they compared were very clearly defined. You have the Early Weight Bearing Group, or EWB. They were told full weight bearing as tolerated, starting on post-op day one. Then you have the Delayed Weight Bearing, or DWB group. They were much more restricted, just toe touch for four full weeks before they could start progressing. So a really clear and clinically relevant difference between the two protocols. And they looked at a whole host of outcomes, which is great. On the clinical side, they use the Parker Mobility Score for Function and the classic numerical rating scale for pain. Then, radiologically, they zeroed in on the two big mechanical worries, femoral neck shortening and any screw back out. And, of course, they tracked the major biological complications we all worry about, like nonunion and AVN. Okay, methods are covered. Let's get to the good stuff. The results. We'll start with a non-displaced fracture group. So think your garden ones and twos. And the data here is, well, it's pretty striking. For these non-displaced fractures, the delayed weight-bearing group came out ahead on every single measure, and it was all statistically significant. Their Parker Mobility Score was higher, meaning better function, their pain scores were way lower, and maybe the most important takeaway, they had significantly less femoral neck shortening. We're talking only 1.65 millimeters on average compared to almost four millimeters in the early group. That is a clinically meaningful difference. Now, if you thought that was interesting, let's see what happened in the more challenging displaced fracture group, our garden threes and fours. This is where we all have the most anxiety about the stability of our fixation. Before we throw numbers around, let's just quickly remember why we're so obsessed with femoral neck shortening. It's not just some abstract measurement on an x-ray, right? It messes with the entire biomechanics of the hip. It can lead to a trend limber gait, chronic pain, and a real, significant hit to the patient's overall function. This slide shows us exactly how they measured it. Super simple and reproducible. They just measured the change in the distance from the tip of the screw to the cortex, comparing the immediate post-op film to the final follow-up. It gives a really clear picture of how much that fracture has collapsed over time. So what did they find for the displaced fractures? Brace yourselves. In the early weight-bearing group, the average femoral neck shortening was 8.91 millimeters. I mean, that's nearly a centimeter of collapse. That's a huge clinical problem. And now let's look at the delayed group. Their average shortening, less than half that at 4.26 millimeters. The difference between these two protocols is just dramatic. Looking at the full table for the displaced fractures just hammers this point home. 
the delayed weight-bearing group had significantly better mobility scores, and as we just saw, way less shortening. What's also really interesting is that there was no significant difference in screw back out. This suggests the problem isn't the implant moving, it's the fracture itself impacting and shortening under load. So, we've waded through all the data. What does this actually mean for us on Monday morning in the clinic? Let's boil it down to the key takeaways. This quote from the paper's discussion really says it all. We're not just chasing a pretty x-ray. We're actively trying to prevent this whole cascade of bad outcomes that directly affects our patient's quality of life. Minimizing that shortening is a huge deal. So to sum it all up, the study's conclusions are pretty direct and quite powerful. The delayed weight-bearing protocol was linked with better outcomes across almost every important metric, less shortening, better mobility, and less pain. And this held true for both non-displaced and displaced fractures. And crucially, they achieved this without seeing any increase in non-union or AVN rates. Now, of course, we have to be good scientists here. Every study has its limits. The authors are upfront about this being a retrospective design, which always has the potential for bias. And the final sample sizes after all that matching were relatively small. So these are things we have to keep in the back of our minds. Which brings us to his final, really provocative question. This study gives us some pretty strong evidence that a period of protected weight-bearing might be beneficial. So while we're all waiting for a big perspective, randomized trial to come along, these findings should absolutely make us pause and question the push for immediate weight-bearing in this specific group. It definitely gives us something to think about and debate in our own departments. Thanks for tuning in.